we're going to have open contact and start being introduced to these beings within the next five years at the outside. It's imminent. It's imminent. We're right on the cusp. And uh, they will reintroduce themselves to our society now that we have evolved. We may start seeing more ships. They may actually sort of put themselves in certain positions and hold themselves there so we get used to the idea. One of the gifts that I've been told they will be giving us when we have open contact is holographic representations of our complete history. So I'm very excited about that. They would literally be able to show us holographic representations of Atlantis, of, you know, dinosaurs, of <laughs> all these things. That'll be oh, exciting. Oh my, oh my. <laughs> <laughs> this is just getting more and more exciting. Do you want to cultivate a deeper sense of self-love? Then I have a self-love toolkit for you where I help you boost your self-love. Head over to wisdomfromnorth.com slash self-love tips. Daryl Anka, a warm welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. I'm really excited about having you on the show. I've been following you and watching you for years, and you are the channeler of Bashar, who is an extraterrestrial energy or being from the future. And you've been channeling him for quite some time, for around 40 years. Yes, 40 and years. Yeah, and the Bashar material has been known and said to be one of the most compelling and relevant and dynamic information delivered to this planet to this date. And you are also a director, film producer, doing so much more. And to me, Bashar is really having a teaching that's so self-empowering and powerful teaching. And I'm really curious to hear more about that today and especially his perspective on the shift of consciousness. Okay. Now, before we dive into all of that, for those who are new to you, I assume many in my audience know who you are, but those who are new to you, could you share a little bit about your work and who Bashar is? All right. Well, <clears throat> uh, you know, this all began for me um, 50 years ago when I had two broad daylight UFO sightings here over Los Angeles which started me investigating all sorts of stuff having to do with UFOs and metaphysical phenomena. So <clears throat> many years after the sightings, I was introduced to a channel who was conducting seminars. The entity coming through that channel offered to teach a channeling class. I went into it not thinking I was going to be a channel, but I just wanted to understand how channeling could be taught. So um, during the class, which was a series of guided meditations to get you in touch with whatever you wanted. You know, you could be your own creativity, your own higher mind. Uh, but I received what I can only describe as a telepathic communication and connection from Bashar that uh, allowed me to experience within a split second a memory of having made an agreement to do this before this life and understanding that the UFO had been shown to me to get me to start moving forward and doing the research I needed to do so that when it came time to do the channeling, I would be somewhat prepared. And um, while all this was going on in my head, uh, I didn't say anything. This happened in literally a split second. The entity coming through the channel teaching the class stopped talking and turned to me and said, there's an entity here for you right now if you're ready to begin. And I also noticed that someone behind me in the class <clears throat> had picked up on the same image of Bashar that I'd seen in my head, and she was sketching it on a piece of paper. So I had two outside validations that this wasn't just my imagination or a hallucination or anything like that. And so I decided, all right, let's see where this is going to go. So I started practicing more, and the teacher offered to allow me to co-channel the next class with him because I'd made a lot of progress. And it was in that class that a woman came and asked to have channels as a subject of her thesis paper on the connection between psychology and channeling. So I would go to her house, I would channel for her friends, she would write her notes <clears throat> and make her paper. 
And, you know, word of mouth started spreading. More and more people started showing up week after week until we had to start doing it twice a week. And then we had to start doing it in two houses. And then I had to start renting auditoriums. I started getting invited to different cities, different countries. And here I am 40 years later, <laughs> in a nutshell, still channeling. So that's wow. a very brief idea of how it all kind of came together. Amazing. Now, Bashar is in the future. Now, uh, parallel reality. Right. Uh, right. Uh, is he connected to you somehow? Well, yes, of course. We've made an agreement to do this. I mean, from different perspectives, you can kind of say that, you know, we might be the same soul in different time frames, in different parallel realities, um, or, you know, we're connected through the agreement that we've made to do this. Uh, there are many ways to look at it, all of which could be the exact answer, none of which could be the exact answer. All I know is this is the agreement that was made to do this. So exactly how we're connected energetically, um, you know, I'm not exactly sure. He could be part of a larger, well, he is part of a larger group that I might be connected to, sort of like a, a an extended non-physical or physical team, like with spirit guides and um, soul family and so on and so forth. So it, he might be part of that. I might be part of the same soul family. So there are many ways to kind of look at it, but it's not so much important how we are connected relational wise, because it's more about what's the information and does the information help people and does it work for people, which over 40 years we've discovered that it certainly does. Now, what I've been curious about for a long time is our history. Uh, whether the Darwin's theory about survival of the fittest is actually in one way incorrect and that we have been perhaps created by extraterrestrials and that our history is incorrect and that the pyramids and mysteries are really pointing to this and that this is the information coming forward. And I'm, I'm curious now what Bashar's perspective is on how was humanity created? Yes, he's talked about this. Now, it doesn't necessarily negate the concept of evolution because evolution can happen at any stage when anything is created. So evolution can still be part of the idea, <clears throat> uh, whether you want to call it survival of the fittest or not. Um, but, you know, selective, you know, evolution. Uh, but yes, Bashar's told the story that many, many hundreds of thousands of years ago, uh, there was an extraterrestrial group that came to this planet to do something in particular they needed for their planet to mine certain materials, and that it was a daunting task for them to be able to accomplish in the time they needed to accomplish it. And so they had a very advanced knowledge of genetics. And they looked around and saw that there was a naturally evolved hominid on the planet. You know, we would refer to it as something like Homo erectus or, or one of those naturally evolved hominids. And they decided that they could inject their genetic material into this hominid and create something that was a little bit more like themselves to help them with this work. Uh, and so they created Homo sapiens sapiens. Uh, and we became a species based on the introduction of that extraterrestrial genetic material. And this is, you know, this is why <clears throat> you have, you know, the rough translations of the you know, biblical phrases like, you know, man was made in the image of God and so on and so forth, is the gods at those times were really these ETs that we consider to be so much more than ourselves that we were made in the image of. Um, and so they weren't necessarily, according to their laws, supposed to have done that. And therefore, they were eventually recalled. And the remainder of their society still had to take responsibility for the fact that we had been created. And so they had to sort of watch over us for quite a while to make sure that we would be able to move forward on our own path. Uh, that we would evolve, you know, into a society that could sort of 
be left on its own. And again, this is where you get a lot of the stories of, you know, angels visiting humanity and looking out for them and protecting them and, you know, people being led to different places by mysterious phenomena, like, you know, pillars of light and things like that. Uh, so I think that then after a time when they realized that we could create our own civilization, they sort of left us to our own devices. They were always watching, but, uh, you know, wanted to see which way we would go with our free will. And now we've arrived, I think, at a point <clears throat> where they have been watching for quite some time. And I think we are approaching the time where they are about to let us know that they've always been here. We're about to have open contact. I think it's actually pretty imminent now. And uh, they will reintroduce themselves to our society now that we have evolved to a certain point where we're starting to explore the idea of expansion of consciousness. We're starting to understand we're not alone in the universe. And all these kinds of things open us up to being able to receive them again, but more as equals rather than as something so much greater than us. Yes, they are more advanced, but that doesn't necessarily mean on a soul level that they're better than us. So once we have arrived at this point where we may be ready to understand how to interact with extraterrestrials, I think we're ab about to be reintroduced to them in the next few years. That's really exciting. And that is actually what I'm hearing again and again from several mm -hmm. channelers. Now, uh, have Bashar said anything about how that will look like? Because I assume the reason it hasn't happened yet is because we haven't been ready. And there has been a lot of fear around this. So how, yeah. how will it look like? Well, it could look many ways. I mean, one thing he has recently said is, you know, we may start seeing more ships. Uh, more blatantly, they may actually sort of put themselves in certain positions and hold themselves there. So we get used to the idea, like they might appear over the ocean. So, you know, they're not over our heads, but we can stand on the shore and we can see them. That might be one way. And they might just stay there for quite some time so that we just get used to the idea that they're here without necessarily directly interacting. But then eventually, I think, uh, you know, they will come down, they will introduce themselves, or they will be introduced. Part of the thing I think that people uh, are not really aware of is that on a certain small level, contact has already happened. And there are certain things that have been going on behind the scenes with certain limited government institutions where they've already been creating preparation for this. And therefore, by the time they're introduced to us, <clears throat> the ETs, sort of, they will already have been interacting with us to a certain degree. And so the agencies that can say, yes, you know, they've been here, we've been working together on certain things, they're peaceful, they're benign, they're here for our, our benefit, uh, will be able to explain that uh, since they've been here already for quite some time, there's really nothing to be afraid of and that they can, you know, be introduced to society in a way that we can handle, probably in stages, probably steps at a time to get us again used to the idea that these beings do exist. Now, when we talk about the idea of open contact, ironically, we're really only talking about something that's new to what you might call general Western society because a lot of indigenous cultures, American Indians and so on and so forth, have known for thousands of years that these beings have existed. They've had contact with these beings off and on for thousands of years. To them, their ancestors from the stars have always been around. So when we talk about open contact, we're not necessarily talking about something that's new for every culture on the planet. We're talking about something that's new for the Western cultures on the planet because we haven't necessarily allowed ourselves to be aware completely in the same way these indigenous cultures have that these beings have been around for quite some time. But one of the things that they, you talked about history at the beginning, one of the gifts that I've been told they will be giving us when we have open contact is holographic representations of our complete history 
going back thousands of years. So we will be able to fill in the gaps of what's missing and understand where we came from and therefore where we're going. So oh. I'm very excited about that. They would literally be able to show us holographic representations of Atlantis, of you know dinosaurs, of <laughs> all these things that we have been investigating and speculating about for so long. And they actually have recordings of these things that they will give us. So that'll be oh, exciting. Oh my, oh my. <laughs> this is just getting more and more exciting. And even yeah. in our lifetime, that's what you're saying, our lifetime. My understanding, and this comes not only from Bashar, but from a couple of other uh, very well-known and pretty strong psychics, is that we're going to have open contact and start being introduced to these beings within the next five years at the outside. It's mm -hmm. imminent. It's imminent. We're right on the cusp. Now, during the times of the of, uh, Egypt, uh, where they were uh, on its... Uh, what do you say when when they built the or the pyramids were built? It seemed like they had help because all of a sudden uh, that civilization was super intelligent and created all these amazing yeah. buildings. Now, is that is that what happened yeah. that they got help from extraterrestrials? And is that I, going to happen now? Because I think yeah, I think longer yeah. ago there was extraterrestrial technologies that were shared, but probably shared more with the culture in Atlantis. And when Atlantis was destroyed, the survivors went into the Mediterranean uh, as well as other places, uh, the Americas and so on and so forth, and brought that knowledge and technology with them. So it's probably that the technology was handed down from extraterrestrials to advanced cultures like Atlantis, and Atlantis brought it into Egypt and the, the Central and South American areas where all of a sudden, yes, these gigantic pyramids were being built. Uh, mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons. So, uh, yeah, by proxy, I think it's it's ET technology, but I think it came through some of the, you know, more advanced cultures like Atlantis that existed at the time, and they're the ones who taught those other cultures like the Egyptians and, and Central American indigenous natives how to do those kinds of things. There might have been still ongoing, you know, intermittent communication with ETs uh, at the time, but I think by the time Atlantis was destroyed, the survivors brought that information with them that they had learned probably from ETs or other methods from so long ago, even before the destruction. Mm. And Bashar, I have to ask, has he shown himself to you how he looks like? Because Yes, I know what he looks like in, in well, like I said, when I first made the telepathic connection with him, I could see what he looks like. He's a hybrid being, um, similar to humans, but uh, very pale, very slight, smaller, slightly smaller than we are, about five feet tall. Uh, no hair on the males, hair on the females, tends to be white on the females. Uh, their eyes are much larger than ours. Mouths, nose, and ears are much smaller. Heads are a little bit larger than what we're used to. Uh, but, you know, kind of very thin, very slight. Um, it's the eyes that really stand out. Skin is very pale, almost like paper. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I've seen him in dream connections, dream contacts, um, about four or five times. And I know that it's different than a normal dream because the only thing that's happening is I'm actually just talking to him and he's talking to me during the entire course of the dream. Like we're literally having a conversation like I'm having with you. So those are very different than a regular dream. So I've seen him in that context. We depicted what he looks like in the documentary that we did called First Contact, um, you know, that's available for people to watch. <clears throat> uh, so they can get to see, because we recreated with computer graphics, uh, the ideas of the sightings I saw of his ship, what his ship looks like inside and out, what he looks like, what his civilization looks like, his planet looks like. All of that exists uh, in depictions in the uh, First Contact documentary that we created several years ago. So he is not a gray, uh, but he looks a bit no. like it's, him? It's a combination of the grays and earth humans. That's what we're referring to as hybrid. So it's like 
between the grays and a, and a typical earth human. Mm. So, yeah. Some are speaking of uh, these cycles, like a 26,000 uh, year cycle where uh, humanity goes through these phases of a golden age and then a downfall and a golden mm. golden age. And I'm curious, is that what was happening? We're moving towards the golden age and then we do the same thing again? Well, no, I think it's different now. I mean, yes, we're at the end of one cycle and the beginning <clears throat> of another, but um, I think it's a little different now because we're elevating to a certain point. And uh, according to Bashar, you know, eventually we will simply evolve beyond needing to incarnate on the earth now and leave the earth to other beings to use it as their school, so to speak, their experience. And, you know, we can still function in spirit as guides for them. But, you know, this may take place in, you know, a thousand years, whatever, you know, 2000 years. But I think we're sort of, you know, by choice coming together to be able to sort of finish this story of the evolution of humanity. Because according to Bashar, now with the introduction of the hybrids that will eventually be coming to live among us, <clears throat> Uh, we're evolving into what he calls the sixth hybrid race. And eventually that will allow us to blend with the other hybrids and become the seventh hybrid race, which will usher in, according to him, a uh, hundred thousand years of peace in the galaxy. So, you know, this seems to be a slightly different story, uh, ending to a story that's been going on for a long, long time. So I, I think we're sort of in that end process that end cycle for that and then we'll move on and uh, other beings can come and and utilize the planet uh in ways that they need to to experience incarnations and tell their stories so we'll see but you know <laughs> that's quite a ways away wow <clears throat> are we all into this project or are there other forces who will not evolve in the same way yeah it's we still have free will so you know a lot of people will be involved in this, but a lot of people may choose not to be. They may go their own way. They may experience other kinds of things. Uh, <clears throat> remember, Bashar has sort of said, you know, all parallel versions of Earth all exist at the same time. And you never change the planet you're on. You change yourself and you constantly shift to different versions of Earth that are more reflective of the change in your own frequency. So some people may go the way of contact, some people may not go the way of contact, and they may continue to experience things that allow them to process whatever they need to process, while other people may go uh, into shifting into other versions of Earth that will allow them to experience what they prefer. So we still all have free will, and we can decide, you know, whether we want to go with positive or negative, love or fear, and that will navigate us through the different versions of parallel reality earths that are reflective of whatever it is we feel we would like to still experience or continue to experience yeah from what i understand Bashar speaks about that we're in a simulation and um, many channelers are speaking about that we create our own uh, reality mm -hmm. and that we're in our own reality and mm -hmm. i'm curious how in a way, concrete, that is how literally they mean that? Is they mean it very literally. In other okay. words, you and I right now are communicating through a device. You're not seeing me directly. You're seeing an electronic recreation of my image, right? True. Okay. So Bashar is saying reality is kind of like that. Everyone in your reality they're real beings, but you're creating your simulation of them in your energy, in your reality, by agreement to interact with them. So we're creating interfaces for each other to interact with, just like this is an interface for you and I to interact. We're not seeing each other directly. We're seeing our representational interfaces made out of this electronic medium. So physical reality is literally like that. You are in your own reality, but you're aware on a higher level there are other beings. And based on the agreements you make with those other beings collectively, you create your version of them in your reality out of your own consciousness. So you have something 
representative to interact with. The ones that you don't make agreements with are still around. They're still here. Everything is here, but you don't see them. They're in different realities because they're in different frequencies based on not having made an agreement to interact with them. Now, because we're expanding our consciousness, we're broadening our bandwidth, so to speak, people are starting to see things beyond what the normal consensus originally agreed to see. So people are starting to see spirits. People are starting to see more UFOs. Things that exist in parallel realities of different frequencies, but because our consciousness is expanding, our senses are sharpening and being able to reach into those and create simulations of those things because now we accept that those things might exist. We've made an agreement to start experiencing those through the representations we're creating in our own realities. So, yeah. Wow. Like that. <laughs> I don't feel like I'm getting it, but uh, maybe I'm not supposed to. <laughs> no, it's not, it's not that complex. You'll get it. But again, like I said, this is a perfect analogy right now. You are not seeing me. I exist and you exist, but what we're seeing is a representation of each other in, 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 out on this electronic screen. And in my reality now, I'm speaking with you, but you're speaking with me in your reality, right? but that's your reality. So they're two different realities? They are two different realities that mm -hmm. are extremely similar because we have agreed to communicate. And therefore, they have to be similar enough for us to understand each other. So, <clears throat> but, but my version of you may not be anyone else's version of you. There may be slight differences. They might not be very noticeable because they're so slight, but they are slightly different. And your version of me is probably slightly different than anyone else's, even though it may not be very noticeable. So, yeah, it's just that it, it's so minimal in terms of what we've agreed to experience that you can't necessarily tell that I'm not in the same reality that you are. <laughs> so where, uh, how does parallel realities and reincarnation, how do they go together? Because then that doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, it makes sense when you understand that reincarnation is something that's happening within the soul. It's not a soul going from place to place. From physical space-time perspective, a linear space-time perspective, it, it, it is experienced as if it's a memory. That's why we think of it as the past and the future. And we have past lives and future lives and present lives. But everything exists right now. Everything exists at the same time. So you're making energetic connections to other people that coexist at the same time you do. In a parallel reality, we label the past, but they still exist. It's just that when we make those energy connections for our own reasons, and we download experience and information from those people's experience, we interpret that as a memory of having lived that life. But it's all happening in the present. This is why you get that old idea of, oh, you know, <clears throat> 50 different people say they were Cleopatra. Well, that's only possible if Cleopatra exists at the same time we all do, and 50 people, for whatever reason, identify strongly with what she represents and connect to her energetically at the same time. But they're interpreting that as a memory of, oh, I was Cleopatra, mm -hmm. or I was Julius Caesar. What they're actually saying is, I'm connecting to Cleopatra. I'm connecting to Julius Caesar, and I'm downloading experience and information from that person's life that's going on at the same time mine is, but I'm interpreting that as a memory. Therefore, it must have happened to me, but that's not the case. That's the effect. So reincarnation and past life memories are an effect, but the actual mechanism is that everything exists and everyone exists right now. And the reason that we have that experience of reincarnation is because we interpret that connection as a memory. Hmm. because of space and time, the way we view reality from a linear perspective. Does that help? Yes, it helps you explain it so well. I'm just fascinated. I've had a lot of practice. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, I want to jump over to Bashar's teachings that I find mm -hmm. very powerful. And he says, follow your passion, follow your passion. And I'm all about following my passion. And when yeah. I started doing that, my life just became uh, wonderful, to be honest. Yeah. Um, Me too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Let me ask that first. How mm -hmm. has Bashar's <clears throat> teaching changed your life? Oh, well, much in the same way. I mean, you know, the amount of synchronicity that happens in my life is stunning. <clears throat> uh, my, you know, emotional balance is better after applying his information. Things get more effortless, more creativity in my life, more joy. <clears throat> it's just smoother. It's like it, there's less effort. There's, a, of course, there are challenges, uh, but it's, it's, you know, more fun. It's, it's not like a struggle. It's not, there's no striving in that sense, no struggling. Uh, it's, it's more like curiosity, like, oh, what's the next challenge? What am I going to discover? What am I going to learn? How is this going to pull me forward? <clears throat> um, so it, it's complete attitude change and a complete experiential change of how you experience your life and everything and everyone in it. You look at things from a very different perspective. You understand things from another point of view, <clears throat> and it's very beneficial. Things work more easily because you understand how things work, because that's what he's explaining. This is how you create your reality. This is what it's based on. He's literally handing us an instruction manual. You follow the simple steps in the instruction manual. <clears throat> everything works as advertised to your benefit. You don't follow it. Things may work, but it may not be to your benefit because you're not aware of what you're doing and how you're creating your experiences in life. But with the formula, as he calls it, <clears throat> with the instruction manual, he breaks it down to, look, this is what you're already doing. Just become more conscious of the fact that you're doing it this way. This is how it works. This is what you need to know. And when you apply it in your physical reality, you get the effect. You get the difference. And this is why it's so important and what I always tell people, you don't have to believe that Bashar is real. This could be coming from another level of my own consciousness, this information. The proof is the information itself. The information actually does make a difference. It does cause an effect in your physical life. So that's the most important thing to focus on. Not, is it really coming from an ET? Is it coming from the channel's own higher consciousness? Is it coming from a spirit guide? That doesn't matter. What matters is the information is beneficial, constructive, creative. It allows us to be self-empowered and exercise our free will to choose. And it actually creates a different form of experience in your physical reality. To me, that's all the proof I need is you get a different effect by actually applying this. <laughs> What does he say about uh, us planning perhaps our lives, having certain destiny points, mm -hmm. uh, contracts, people to meet, and also yes. to experience, for instance, oh, I'm gonna, going to learn about um, forgiveness, or I'm going to learn mm -hmm. about lack of self-love. Yeah, uh, we, we do lay that all out as spirits <clears throat> before we have the physical experience. Uh, now, there is still free will, about how you go about experiencing that that you've laid out for yourself. So it's like you you use your free will as a spirit <clears throat> to lay out a destiny, so to speak, for your physical mind, your physical experience. And so your physical being has to go through that. So you can look at that as destiny, but that was created by the free will of your spirit. <clears throat> now as the physical person, you have the free will to decide how to go through that. So let's say that your destiny is like a hallway. Your spirit has said, you will walk down this hallway as you. This is you. You're unique. You can't do it in any other way other than doing it as you, this physical person. But how you do it is up to you. You can be happy. You can be sad. You can run. You can walk. You can crawl. You can go fast. You can go slow. You can look in every door down the hallway. You can ignore them all and try to go straight to the end but you will walk down that hallway. That's your life path. <clears throat> so it's up to you with your free will to decide how you're going to experience that hallway, how you will experience the life path, the speed at which you do it, the scale, the scope of how things happen, what you're willing to plug into, what you're willing to unplug from. 
Uh, so you have a lot of leeway in how you experience what the soul has laid out, but it's still you. You're still the soul. This is what you agreed to experience. This is what you chose to experience in general. And it's about what you learn from it, and what you make of it, how you transform the challenges that come into your life that are representative of what the soul chose to experience for its own growth, its own expansion. So you have to work hand in hand with that. So if I create my own reality, can I create another hallway if I want? I Can I con change it completely because no. I have the power? I can't. You would be a different person. Ah. So anything that you're experiencing in this life that you do appear to transform or change is part of your life path. You can't experience it if it's not part of your life path. Okay, so it's within my potential as Yannick's yes. life path. Okay. Because that's the whole idea of the challenge. What are you challenging yourself to do? Go beyond the parameters you set up for yourself. Go beyond what you think is possible. So that's part of your life path is to expand beyond the challenges that present themselves to you. <clears throat> right. And so, yeah, you don't have to have a different life path to experience that. That is part of your life path. Yeah, that makes sense to me. And Bashar speaks about changing your beliefs about yourself. And mm -hmm. I find some beliefs have been easier to change than others. That's and a belief. Um, yeah. That's <laughs> a belief. See, that's one of the challenges is to watch the definitions about, because he's saying there's no such thing as a difficult situation. It's our beliefs and definitions that make it difficult. So when you say some things are more difficult than others, that is something you have been trained to buy into as a belief. That's mm. something to overcome, is to understand, yes, I understand one thing may seem more challenging than another because that's the challenge we've set up for ourselves specifically to transform. But that doesn't mean it has to be harder to change. It just means that there may be an additional process for us to go through to understand how to change it. But that doesn't make it difficult. That just makes it deeper. It mm -hmm. takes a deeper understanding to transform that thing as opposed to transforming something else. But we don't need to translate that as difficulty. We can translate that as, okay, this is something that's teaching me a lesson that's really valuable. So you can look at it as difficult or you can look at it as more valuable. And that's why it takes more process to go through it because it's more enriching. It's deeper. It's something that's profound in your life as a challenge, as opposed to some other challenges that may be smaller or may not seem like challenges at all. So rather than defining the bigger ones as difficult, it's probably easier to define them. It will become easier to experience them if you define them as more enriching, more hmm. valuable, more right. of a lesson for you to expand yeah. and grow. That's very helpful. Hmm. Now, I observe, maybe you do that as well, that it seems like many, many people uh, are constantly escaping and running away from things and that we humans suffer from this void inside and we want to fill it up with mm -hmm. things, uh, too much work, alcohol, drugs. What is this, this feeling of emptiness? Is that the separation <clears throat> Well, it's it's the experience. Yeah, it's the experience of separation. You can't be disconnected from source. You wouldn't exist. So it's the experience we have created that we seem to be separate. That's part of the illusion. So it comes from having to sort of forget who we are in order to rediscover who we are from a new point of view. That's how things grow. That's how creation expands because the structure of existence never changes. What changes is your relationship to it, your experience of it, your perspective of it. So we have to kind of forget what we were as infinite souls in order to limit and focus ourselves into this physical personality version of ourselves that gets to experience the process of creation, the process of discovery, the new perspective of discovering something about ourselves from another point of view. And that's how creation expands. So sometimes because of the nature of that focus, the depth of that focus, uh, we can forget who we are to such an extreme 
that we actually can start experiencing sensations like we're totally disconnected. We have no connection to source. We're alone. And that starts going into things like we're not worthy, we're not valuable, we're not deserving. All of those negative ideas, because remember, the universe basically is based on love or fear. These are the opposites. <clears throat> love and hate are not opposites. Love and fear are the opposites. And that's the positive and the negative. Now, it's all ultimately based on love, but the idea is the negative side of it, fear, is what feels like the absence of that love. You're never actually disconnected. You have to be connected to create an experience of disconnection. That's the irony. That's the paradox of it. So it's up to us to understand that we have created this focus for the actual purpose of rediscovering who we are, re connecting, so to speak, uh, even though we are connected, but rediscovering that connection from a new point of view. We're actually totally indestructible beings. Our souls are indestructible. Uh, they're infinite, you know, but as physical personalities, we're exploring something that helps round out the soul, that helps engage the soul, it helps enrich the soul, it helps the soul understand itself in a new way, from a new point of view, and it expands it in that way. So, we have to understand the paradox that there's really nothing missing within us, but we can create the experience as if there is. And then if we don't really have the toolkit to understand how to address that properly in a positive way, then yeah, we try to fill that hole, that emptiness with things that never actually work. That's the source of addiction. Or we're trying to numb over that emptiness so we don't have to face it. That's where fear comes in because we're afraid to look at ourselves because we're afraid that if we actually dig down deep and look at ourselves, we're going to find out that it's true that we're not worthy. It's true that we're not deserving. That will never actually be true. But mm. that's the fear that comes with it. And you have to understand also how belief systems work because in order to have a physical experience, you have to buy into certain beliefs being real. There are positive beliefs and there are negative beliefs. We don't have a problem with the positive ones because they reinforce themselves and perpetuate themselves in positive ways. But the negative beliefs, by definition, have to perpetuate themselves so you continue to have a physical experience. But they perpetuate themselves just like the positive ones do, but they do it in negative ways. So negative beliefs, in order to make sure you don't let them go, will amp up the fear so that you will continue to hold on to them. You have to see through that as simply a story that we're being told to perpetuate our physical reality experience, but that we don't have to buy into the story that the negative belief is telling us. We can actually start going into the story that the positive beliefs are telling us, and it's just as real. See, that's one of the negative beliefs we have is that what the positive side says is not as real as what the negative side says, right? That's what we're saying, well, oh, I'm a realist. You know, I know that things can go sour at any minute and therefore I have to make sure I'm protected and, you know, all this. And so you, you sort of armor yourself up and you're not actually necessarily really living life to the fullest in the way that you could because you're so afraid that something bad's going to happen. You're afraid to move forward. So you have to be careful to balance the idea out in ways where you can use the negative beliefs to overcome them, to transform them in ways that allow you to move forward in a positive way. So this is sort of, again, getting into how this psychology works, how motivation works, the mechanisms of consciousness, the mechanisms of the physical mind. This is one of the things I really enjoy about what Bashar does is he explains these so well as actual mechanisms. So that once you get a handle in your head on, oh, that's a mechanism and here's how it works, now I understand how I can use that mechanism in a more positive way, because there's no difference to the universe whether you decide to experience positive or negative energy. The universe doesn't have a mind of its own. Creation doesn't have a mind of its own. You are its mind. You are its expression. So it's saying, hey, I'm going to support you unconditionally. If you want to go down a negative path, I am going to support you unconditionally by reinforcing that negativity. If you want to go down a positive path, I'm going to support you unconditionally by reinforcing the positive side. It doesn't take sides. You're the one in charge. Right. Wow. 
Wow, incredible. Uh, thank you so much. It's so concrete. It's so tangible, I feel like, uh, because sometimes these teachings confuse me. But uh, Yeah, well, that's what I like about him is he takes these things that have been for a long time very ambiguous and nebulous sort of concepts that are sort of left out there. I mean, yeah, you've heard, you know, follow your bliss, act on your passion. But why? Why does that work? The thing I appreciate about Bashar's information is he explains it mechanically. That's why it works. This is how it works. So when he does that, then you have a deeper understanding as, oh, now that makes sense. Now I understand why people are always instinctively saying that, but I never understood why that actually made sense or why it physically makes a difference in my life. He's explaining how it physically works. So then, you're got, then you've got a toolkit that you can use and apply in a very practical, grounded, <clears throat> down-to-earth way. No pun intended. I'm curious, do you listen to other channelers and do, do you find sometimes contradictions between teachings or is it just truth from a different perspective? Usually it's truth from a different perspective. And sometimes what seems like a contradiction isn't really a contradiction when you understand the underlying concept behind it and you will realize it's just being expressed in a very different way using different terminology, different language, because people need to hear things in different ways because of the way that they're brought up. <clears throat> now, sometimes there can be contradictions and, you know, that could be simply an error in the channeling. It could be a glitch. It could be the channel's personality kind of getting in the way momentarily, depending upon their skill level at bringing things through and what they're connecting to it can be for a variety of reasons. Uh, and you have to kind of take it on a case by case basis. So, you know, it's always about does the information work for you? You can always take the parts of it that work and leave the parts that don't work for you behind. You get to decide that. So it's like looking at a menu. You don't have to order everything on the menu. You can order what you want. So when you hear any source of information, including Bashar's, you decide, yeah, that sounds good to me. That works for me. And this other part right now, I can't wrap my mind around it. It doesn't make sense to me. You can leave that behind. Remember, there's no hurry about this. You're an infinite eternal spirit. What's your rush? You're going to be around forever. You're going to be able to always have a second chance to learn something, to decide what works and what doesn't work. You are always going to have that experience again and again and again and again. It never ends. It never ends. So there's no hurry to it. There's no rush. You don't have to like get everything, you know, all your ducks in a row right now. But, you know, the more you do, the better off you are. But it's up to you to decide that. It's not up to anyone else. That's why Bashar says, look, I'm sharing this information with you all. What you do with it is none of my business because I'm just telling you, here's some options. These things work for us. We know they can work for you, but you have to be the one to decide that and apply them because we're not telling you what your life path is. You've already decided that. Mm -hmm. So if some of this information works for you, use it. If it doesn't, don't. That's completely in your hands. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm giving you options you get to decide whether or not you want to use them. Mm. So, I like that. What is the deepest spiritual insights that uh, Bashar has given you about uh, the nature of reality? Well, it's our creation. We are creating this by consensus, by agreement to have a certain experience. We're playing by certain rules because that's the game we're playing. <clears throat> we wanted to do this as part of the expansion of existence. Uh, you know, we're all aspects and reflections of all that is, of God, goddess, all that is, whatever you want to call it. It doesn't care what you call it, uh, because anything you could call it is <laughs> still referring to it, whatever you want to say that that is. Um, <clears throat> so again, it's unconditional. I think a lot of people really need to look that word up, unconditional, instead of saying, oh yeah, it's unconditional, except for these conditions. No, there are no conditions. There's no judgment. It's up to you to decide what you want to experience as a soul, and you get to choose different things all the time. So no matter what state you're in, physical, non-physical, you still have free will. You still get to choose. Uh, I think that's kind of one of the most profound things. Our greatest power is the power to choose what we want to experience next. Now, we can have guidance. We have councils. We have soul families. We have spirit guides. We have angelic beings. We have all these beings we can consult with. 
But ultimately, the decision is each and every one of ours. We get to decide what it is we are all about, what reflection of all that is we are, and what we want to experience. And that freedom never goes away. So I think that's pretty profound. Beautiful. You may have answered it, but what is the most important uh, message that Bashar has, especially now in 2024? Well, it is about acting on your passion. And there are several you know, things that go along with that. It's, that's not just left that. There are like five steps. So, <clears throat> But the idea is to understand why that's important. So we have this physical mind, but we also have the non-physical higher mind, which is basically the soul that we are. The soul attempts to communicate to the physical mind to guide it. But the soul speaks in a language of energy. It sends energy as a message. Our physical bodies translate that energy message as the sensation we call passion, excitement, attractiveness, curiosity, love, creativity. That's how we translate the message from the soul saying, look, this opportunity that has arrived in your life that contains a lot of passion or more passion than anything else, more excitement than anything else, even just a little bit more, I'm telling you that's your next step. That's why it comes with passion. That's why you have that feeling toward it. This is the next step to act on. This is the next step to take on your path. That's your guidance. That's the beacon to follow, is yeah. that sensation. So when you follow it, <clears throat> When you act on it, you are responding to the soul's message saying, okay, I heard you. Thank you for your guidance. I'm going to do that. When you don't act on it, the soul is not going to send you more opportunities to act on your passion because you're not acting on what it's already sent you. That would be pointless. You have to act on it to start the ball rolling, to start mm -hmm. the dialogue between you to become more fluid. When you are willing to act on it, it sends you more opportunities. Synchronicity comes in and sends you more opportunities to act on your passion, and it builds and builds and builds. Now, you have to understand a lot of people find this a little bit confusing because when we say act on your passion, Bashar doesn't mean that you have to be jumping up and down with your hair on fire running around like crazy. He simply means it's what feels correct to you to do that is true for you at this moment, that sings to your heart, that sings to your soul. It could be meditating. It could be something very peaceful and calm, but it's what feels right for you to do next. And the idea is it can start very small. <clears throat> it doesn't have to be big projects or life-spanning careers. When he talks about acting on your passion, he means look around at all the choices you have on a daily basis. Simple things. You could take a walk. You could have a conversation with someone. You could eat a meal. You could watch a movie. You could read a book, et cetera, et cetera. Just pick the one that sings to you the most, that has the most attractiveness, even if it's just the tiniest bit more than any other choice that you have the ability to do something about, to take an action on. And do that one first. See where it leads you. When you're done with that, when the, the excitement wanes or you have no ability to take further action, look for the next thing that has more excitement that you have the ability to act on than anything else and act on it next. Synchronicity is the organizing principle of our lives. <clears throat> it shows us that everything is connected and it brings you things in the order in which you need to do them. So by bringing it with more excitement than anything else, it's telling you, do this first. When you're done with that, do this next. When you're done with that, do this next. And if you keep on doing that, you are following your passion, even if it's on a simplistic level. But very often when you do that, it starts to build and it starts to become bigger and more synchronous events happen that draw you into circumstances where you go, oh, now I can do this bigger thing. Now I can do this bigger thing. And now this is representative of my passion and it grows. And it also supports you in life because it would be pointless to be acting on your passion if it didn't somehow support you to allow you to keep acting on your passion. Now, there are many forms of support I'm not just talking about money, because there are many forms of abundance. Synchronicity is one of those forms. Being given a gift is one of those forms. Having something to trade is one of those forms. Imagination is one of those forms. Communication is one of those forms. All these different forms of abundance can allow you to find the path that works for you 
so that whatever forms of abundance have to be there to help you will be there. But it doesn't mean that only one form will come. Sometimes a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and a little bit more of this will come together to form the 100% abundance that you need to be able to keep moving forward on your passion. So when we start assuming, well, I don't have enough money to do that. I don't have enough of this to do that. We're actually shortchanging ourselves, no pun intended, by closing the doors through which other forms of support and abundance could come to allow us to move forward. So we have to allow all forms of abundance to be equally valid in order for them to all work together to give us what we need to continue to move forward on our path. So it really is an art form, but it's also a very practical understanding of how things actually work energetically in physical reality. Wow, that is just so inspiring. Thank you so much. I This is truly my cup of tea. <laughs> now, I, I would love to speak with you for hours, uh, but we have to wrap up soon. Now, I have some general questions that I ask of my guests. And the first right. one is, what is self-love to you, Daryl Anka? Well, it's recognizing that you are a valuable and valid aspect of all that is. <clears throat> it's treating yourself with that respect. It's allowing you to express the same unconditional love to yourself that all that is supports you in. As I said, it's unconditionally supportive. So it's simply recognizing that you are a reflection of that. And why shouldn't you give yourself the same benefit of the doubt, the same respect, the same unconditional love. Mm -hmm. It helps you function as a being. And what is the deeper meaning of life from your perspective? The irony, <laughs> I know this sounds weird, the irony of the deeper meaning of life is that life is meaningless. You give it meaning. You're designed to give it meaning. And the meaning you give it determines how you experience it. So when I say life is meaningless, I don't mean it's without value. I mean, it doesn't have built in meaning. It doesn't automatically come with built in meaning. Oh, this means that. No, you tell it that it means that. You decide that it means that. So it's the meaning you give it that determines how you experience it. So you give life meaning. That's what we're designed to do. Hmm. Now, Daryl, tell us. What are you most excited about now and how can people connect with you and work with you and follow sure. you? I'm sure many, many want to learn more. Sure. Um, I mean, for anything that's Bashar related, they can go to Bashar.org, B-A-S-H-A-R.org. <clears throat> for things that I'm doing, they can go to DarylAnka.com, D-A-R-R-Y-L-A-N-K-A.com because I've written books and done movies and they can find out all about that there. Or they can go to boggledescaperooms.com because my wife and I operate and own an escape room here in Los Angeles. So B-O-G-G-L-E-D, boggledescaperooms.com. Uh, also, we do monthly Zoom events at Bashar.org uh, where Bashar will talk and answer questions um, on Zoom. And so those events, you can find out all about the schedule for that. I will also be, uh, we just came back from Sedona doing an event there. I'll be in Sedona again in January for the Channel Panel event. Uh, you can find out about that at thechannelpanel.com. So all those places you can find out what I'm doing, what Bashar is doing, and also access a lot of the information that Bashar has delivered in recordings over uh, several years. So that's where they can go to find out stuff. Wonderful. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And thank oh you pleasure. for coming to the show on Wisdom from North and for your amazing, inspiring work. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for making this platform available because that's how information is best shared. So I thank you for the work that you're doing and allowing me to be a part of it today. Thanks. Thanks.